Peace. Sam Nott, wishing you all a very merry season of lights. Reading from part two of Mabon Calling. A small group of us are climbing up through the oak wood, heading for the moor just beyond the twin dragons. We are in search of a mysterious sacrament, but the mood is, as ever with Doc, somewhat irreverent. He wants us to solve a riddle, which he seems to be improvising. With random shit on my golden hat, I sing to the stars in the rainbow grass. Anyone? No? Let's see. Neither plant nor beast, with just one leg and quite some feet, I leap into the empty pit of your uncontainable laughter. No? Really? Well, actually, I think I'm not the only one who might be able to guess what he's going on about, but the turn of phrase is rather entertaining, so I keep stum. <clears throat> okay, from the outer brain of space, with the hole inside my face, runs the language of a race that's never over. Hmm? No? What about again and again, from the trees unto the plain, I express what cannot be explained by dancing in the rain. Yes? No? Anyone? Unfurling umbrella of time in the gaps, synapsing. One brave fool pipes up. Are you talking about drugs, Doc? He laughs. Yes and no, I suppose. I am tall king of yon wee elf hat, the silly sybean blah 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 mush room. Yeah, I expected it was that. Uncle Wayback has something of an obsession with them. I used to enjoy looking for them hidden in his pics and poems, so I did a little research about them. Am I right in thinking they are basically the active ingredient of Micron, Doc? Doc gets kind of agitated then. Don't get me started on the mics. They took the whole soul out of the thing. Kind of weird reversal of Paracelsus's law, that the only difference twixt the poison and the medicine is the dose and all that. Well, we should have bloody n well known it went both ways. Some things are poison when you don't take enough. Seriously, fucking mics. I guess I should probably change the subject. So they grow round here at this time of year, do they, Doc? I thought they were creatures of the fall. <clears throat> now, Doc goes into a long ramble about the nature of time, involving elvish plumbers riding coracles along rivers of blood and cities of hollow bone and some kind of cosmic honeycomb and this idea of going in and out at the same time that I really like, by which somehow... We come to be seeing the planets swinging about the sun and the huge rotating arms of the Milky Way and this black hole of an idea which is the universe spinning itself inside out. These internested loops which serve the function of making time in or else out of eternity for all of us to play in or with or something. It might be like Milk in time from eternity even. The stars like drops of milk from the udder of some great black space cow. And so, of course, all this business makes us sweat. And this sweat is basically the water of life. The self-same, elf-same thing. As well as being something like honey for otherworldly buzzing beings beyond time. And so time itself is all the things we normally think it is, and yet more, including a wave made by the wobble of our planet, which gives us the seasons, by which the fall of autumn and the rising saps of spring can be called akin. And the elves can then use such superficially linguistic phenomena 
to move through time however they very well please. And basically, that is why we can find shrooms in spring too. And if I find this stuff really interesting, I should go get Goat and make him tell me about the word made flash. Well, I intend to do just this. But I'm also a bit worried that Doc might be having a laugh at my expense. I believe I might be prone to taking the poetry a little too literally, or else, and perhaps more worryingly, reality has started literally going a bit too poetry. The moor is stunning in the morning light. Dew hung spider webs are strung between the rushes, while a small herd of big ginger cattle with long hair and even longer horns lays about scratching themselves on a row of old lichen-covered stones. Doc wastes no time in finding a group of mushrooms and calls us over to display their most marked characteristics, pointing out their distinctive bell shapes with little nipples on top and then the dark grey gills underneath. And now he's pulling some tiny translucent skin from the cap and peering through it at me. See? And the whole scene seems covered in a substance that transfigures light. Some thin prismatic skin. How many do we need for tonight, Doc? He stares up into his head inside the clear blue sky. Let me see, say... Thirty odd people, some of them very odd indeed, need to put a sparkle on it, nothing too crazy, Noonar and the Wav Bar, Crunkle Bump, I Wrinkle, would say a couple of thousand if we can, just to be on the safe side. One brave fool gets up off his knees and holds out his hands, already filled with tiny cosmic parachutes. Wrists and ankles, elbows and knees. Yep, and you want your feet maybe just a little wider than your shoulders. Now, relax yourself, but, you know, keep a good posture. And try to keep nice and bouncy in the knees. Hang loose. Cool. And so just kind of mirror me. I am copying Goat because he has agreed to tell me about the word made flash. But it seems like it's going to be a show rather than tell kind of thing. <clears throat> These actions are designed to quieten my mind by bringing me into my body, whereby I will find myself ready to hear the word, he says. I already do feel rather sensitive in a pleasant open, relieved kind of way. When I came across Goat, he was down by the river, crouched on the bank, looking intently at the flora. He had found a small stand of spring tears, the most beautiful little flowers, pale green petals with frilly edges and bright pink veins running through them, having the most delightful dangly little bell shapes really quite tiny too. You might have three of them standing on your little finger. He showed me why they are called spring tears. He held open one of his eyes and looked to the sky and bade me shake one of the bells above his eyeball. I had to shake for a few seconds, but eventually a small drop of liquid came out and went into his eye. I did both his eyes and then he did mine. He warned me that it might sting a little, and it did, but not too painfully. My eyes, however, watered profusely. I could barely see as the tears poured down my cheeks, and I became more and more pleasantly elated and, like I said, relieved, as if I had just had 
a really good cry about something. A really good cry about nothing, I suppose. So now, here I am, copying him. He is an interesting looking fellow, by the way. Compact, laconic rebel, with Mediterranean skin, dark hair and eyes. He's not so tall as me, perhaps a little bit older, very fit seeming. There is something that feels a little serious or even scary about him. But when I catch his eye, there seems to be nothing but humour there, even kindness. So I cannot quite tell what the scary is about. I think about it for a moment and decide it is because he seems ready and waiting, as if poised on the edge of something, but with the sense that it is his mind that might leap out at you, not his body necessarily. Well, anyway, here we are, raising our arms above our heads, although perhaps letting them fall into the sky would be a better description. He keeps guiding me. So, Feel your heels and the balls of your feet on the ground. Really try to know that contact. Feel free to test it and keep it dynamic. To shift and let the legs ripple with it. Okay. And just here, between your finger and your thumb, is another kind of opening. My hands fall down beside my waist and I hold them parallel to the ground as if patting it. I rotate my wrists a bit and, when I breathe in, all my fingers stretch and my hand opens right out. And when I breathe out, this releases. And sometimes twixt breaths I will just be waiting, not even thinking, just being. More and more I get the sense of moving energy around, as if moving it through my body, but also out there in the world actually seeming to wave it up and down all around me. When we raise our arms, our bodies naturally sink back. And when our arms gently fall, they seem to lift our bodies up. Goat shows me how to open my heart and also how to protect it. After a bit, he gets me to move one of my feet behind me and raises one of my hands up in front palm out, and pushes into this hand. Then, firmly but gently, he pushes the rest of me about, such as would normally cause me to lose my balance. But now I'm so easily rooted to the ground, so much at one with my own weight, that I am simply not going anywhere, and without even feeling like I am resisting at all. It is as if the earth is holding her own through me. He asks if I am ready. We are standing in the circle of stones, and I am facing towards the river, feeling pretty much ready for anything. Yes. He comes close to my ear, and tells me to take a long, steady breath, all the while keeping my gaze straight forward. As I breathe in, he begins to whisper to me, a steady string of syllables that I think I will be able to memorise at first. But by the last sip of breath, there are so many in me as to be quite beyond recalling, already starting to juggle around among themselves and wanting to recombine and pour back out. Otherwise, the world remains as it was, only now speaking a peculiar stillness. I release my breath, long and slow, and by the time I am done breathing out, the world is entirely transformed. My initial response is to rip my shirt off. I shall not be so contained. The world has become a wind, blowing through me as I rush towards the river and into it. Imagine, if you will, Two great wheels, two great wheels that form your entire universe, and they are turning, each towards the other, in towards the centre and down. 
where these wheels mesh, all that you know is both revealed and in motion. This is your world. Now please imagine that you were in fact mistaken. There are not two wheels, but an uncountable number of them. And they enter from and mesh at every conceivable angle or dimension. And they are of every conceivable size. And they are within and without each other too. Such that, though this all be one great movement, now you can see that nothing will ever be quite so simple again. The syllables of the magic word seem to have distilled themselves to an essential few, and I am emitting them as they recycle, which is, in one sense, my way of acknowledging the multidimensional drama I am witnessing, my way of responding to and participating in it, but it is also the world itself, which is also my questioning of it. World as self, and so myself as something else, and then whatever impossible others still insist on being. All there are are these impossible others, really. And so I am an other, and there is no other. I hear a whisper of Uncle Wayback telling me, there are always at least three things going on. But then there are three times three things, and so on and so on and so on. The word is like breath, but it is not really coming into or going out of me. It is simply there. And indeed, though this entire scene seems one great breath, I might easily become unsure that I myself am breathing. I join the great roar in an Ooh, morphing into an ah, then moving back towards the beginning with a you. The sounds seem so prolonged as to be eternal, and yet distinct and recurring, resonant. I am in the river, splashing it into the sky, and each drop is a crystalline gift of coolness. For in one sense the world is on fire and I am burning up. I am aware of many somewhat individual presences. Goat beside me in the river, a being unto himself and yet seeming to partake completely of my experience. The many people gathered in the hall waiting for lunch. Those wandering through Mabonia or sat outside their homes their hobomes, contemplating this same moment. I am aware of the trees, like an ocean of people, and the birds in them, the squirrels and martins and beetles, the multifarious uncats and uncountable greets. And all this be one fire, one breath, one rushing river, and so always something else again, the next thing, the end, and this going back to the beginning, all ways. I watch the trees now. Ooh, are you? Their bodies are a constant, consistent movement, their stillness a perpetually renewing thing. They are still but growing, growing nowhere, growing now, here. They are literally rushing throughout their entire extents like breath, water, fire, their flames flickering branch fingers. They are doing what I am doing. I am what they are. They are one, and we are many. I am, we are, ours. Who are you? I am. Why are who I am? We are asking and answering each other as one great thing, being what we are, this watery, ever-flowing world of breathing, 
of being on fire that is our body. And now I can hear Goat saying, can you see that? And he is pointing out one particular tree, an oak on the other side of the river. And I'm trying to look, but it's as if many layers are superimposed and I do not know how to sort through them for they are rotating through each other, competing for attention. And then, while this motion still continues, it also reveals a somewhat distinguishable thing. It is the tree shrine, and beneath those gift-brightened boughs, I can see who I saw watching me the moment I arrived. The tree is a woman, a beautiful bronze-skinned naked lady, and she is dancing, holding her hands above her head, together at the palms, but with the fingers opening out like a cup, like a crown on top of her head, like the crown of the tree itself, which seems to crown all life as earthen royalty. I hear Goat profess his love, <clears throat> and now we are both at her feet, and the river is in my hands, and I am dressing her with it, tracing her cheeks with my thumbs as she gazes upwards, brushing my electric hands over her breasts, going down over her belly and around her hips, nodding my head as if in prayer against her mound, coming down her legs to rest my hands on her feet and my head on my hands, to kiss her toes, and go crawling off, stroking her continuation in the soil, in the moss, and all this stuff all around us. And as I look around now, propped on my elbows with my belly to the sky, I feel as if the whole place is both resting against me and pressing me against it. I feel as if I've just landed here, simply dropped out the sky, or else freshly materialised right where I thought I already was. I am back. I turn to Goat and thank him for sharing this secret with me, and he grins back. You know what it is, right? And so I tell him, it is, my friend, what it is all about. I go on down to the lake, picking my way through the ash and oak, trying to avoid the odd brown holly leaf on the path, for my shoes are somewhere far behind me. There are the remains of old walls grown over with ivy, here and there a bower of sorts, natural nooks made from stone, and overgrowth that seem to call me to be in them to enclose myself in their openings and see what happens there. See what happens while nothing is going on. But going on, going on, until the lake begins to show itself through leafy windows, on over a small bridge to find myself outside the forest now, and down onto a small stony beach. The great expanse of the lake, a kind of bright blackness, rippling slowly with the mountains and the clouds and the sky all reflected in it, all thinned to a surface, all coming towards me in those slow gentle ripples, and all staying just where it is as well, with my feet inside it, starting to ache from the cold. Going on along the shore, walking along the long, low bough of a lazy ash beside the water. Picking my way carefully among shards of slate, patches of soft grass dotted with sharps of baby gauze. And now looking back inland, up the steep rise of the oak wood, watching a raven find a place to sit on a small cliff, talking with his raven voice in his raven language, 
which I try to learn and speak back to him in a pale imitation of his blacker than black humour. Although it seems he gets the joke. Now I am sat at the long table that is set up in the hall whenever we are not using the floor space for experiments. It is lunchtime. I feel lightly elated and affable, being sat beside the attractive woman who waved at me on the way in. I'm sorry, I don't think I got your name. Her name is Jin. And in case I've not told you already, she has rich golden skin and bright green eyes and coppery hair and loose flowing clothes in saturated earth tones. She is very composed. Her speech is measured, each sentence seeming well considered, and her accent reveals her education. Her gaze is steady, and her mouth tends towards a patient smile. I heard you saying something earlier about a kind of mission you were on, or something, I ask, figuring I can stuff a good mouthful in and let her run for a bit while I chew. Well, not in the sense of some madly fervent quest or something. I was just trying to explain something of my background. I am a nano-stated scientist, you see, specialising in quantum biology. Something people around here are often surprised to hear. As you know, places like this tend to attract people who are more of a creative bent. She's not wrong there, I nod. Many modern people, sorry, asylum seekers, think of tree sigh and what goes on here as in some sense regressive, or even transgressive, I suppose, which in many ways it is, of course, perhaps necessarily so. Anyhow, I suppose I felt called to come here and see for myself. I first came some years back, in fact, and I'm very glad that I did. She pauses for a moment to smile across the table at Doc, who has just looked up at her with a spaghetti-faced grin. She continues. Thus my mission, such as it is, is something of an attempt to bring the two worlds together by doing the same with the two sides of myself, marrying pragmatic science to experimental mysticism, I suppose. Now Doc pipes up one finger held in the air for emphasis. What might easily be missed was moist likely foggy to begin with. I chuckle, along with some others, before the disparate conversations regain their respective attentions. So, was there a particular event or series of events by which you felt the calling, so to speak, she looks at me rather owlishly and smiles. Well, it is a good question, and perhaps I shall give you the whole story one of these days. But basically, I came to realise I was behaving as if I were merely a brain. That is how I felt, as if I were but a brain, soaking up as much information as I could possibly retain. And there were also certain ethical implications to the science I was doing, that I did not think we were taking seriously enough, or making provisions for. I did not want to be part of a project that might somehow harm the human experiment. And so here I am, trying to figure out what other options there might be, in terms of making an approach from a different angle. I have been formulating an idea that I am currently calling slow grass. But most generally, I suppose, I am here completing my education, seeking to administer those aspects my formal schooling left wanting. I find all this very interesting and want to ask more, but now Helio, the well-known co-founders of Plurpix, are asking for everybody's attention. Hey everyone, do you mind if we take the floor for a bit? A lot of people are asking about our plurpics, 
and it would be so nice just to give everyone the basics instead of repeating ourselves. And they say these last words with a kind of cartoon fatigue. Again and again. I refer to Helio in plural because although inhabiting a single body, they are autists who do not subscribe to the so-called single self fallacy and so refuse either to, either to use or respond to other people's use of the common singular pronouns we still habitually employ in reference to ourselves and each other. I think this is kind of fun, like when I wanted to say Helio is one of the co-founders of Plurpix, but then had to stop and rephrase. But it really annoys some people, maybe even most people, if my little piece of the sea is anything to go by, who resent having to change their habits in response to what they feel is simply oversensitivity, or at least that is what they say, thus seeming rather oversensitive themselves. The whole thing can get a bit nasty. I admit some of the more divisive plurs do make me irritable in the way they might seem to suggest that because they have so many selves inside of them, everybody else might only have one, which is clearly not the case, and yet clearly is the case too. For I like to give my more mundane percepts their due, acknowledging I am something of a tidy but confusing or paradoxical package. That is what I means to me, not necessarily some inflexible or exclusive unity or something imposed upon me by sociolinguistics, but a weird and not always completely safe or friendly gathering of sorts that somehow manages to convene me. Uncle Wayback used to say that all conflict was misunderstanding, and so I guess I'm rambling away here because I would like to understand why I feel conflicted about Helio. It's not like Nanostate has made any silly rules about what I must call them. I do it out of my own goodwill and because I empathise with their predicament. So I'm pretty sure it's not anything to do with that. Perhaps I am troubled by the simple fact that I do not seem to connect with them. I get the feeling that we do not really like each other at all, in fact. And this troubles me because there is a lot about them that ticks my boxes. On paper, they are the kind of people I should get on with. So I cannot tell what or who the source of the discomfort is. I have a sudden flashback to a dream in which I am passionately kissing them, which is a little unnerving. But then I wonder if it isn't my psyche telling me that we are entwined somehow, that my irritation towards them is somehow what our relationship is meant to be. In other words, that our not really liking each other is just another way for us to love each other. Part of what binds me to them is also that I used to consider myself an artist, see. I myself made Urpix. At least, I used to say I did, before they became so massively popular and plurally rebranded. I liked the idea of Urpix, this notion of entering the imagination and finding the essences there that we could then share, and also that somehow in making Deepix of them, we would get more of an idea of who we were, of how great and crazy the world inside might be, how much realer even than we realised. I have a lot of respect for Helio's art. It is beautiful in its way, and certainly technically very accomplished. So perhaps it's more the general scape of things nowadays, reflecting back on this more original work to make it seem less so. If nothing else, there seems a very limited palette of techniques, almost like a uniform. People seem to be saying, if you want to make an urpix, you should depix like this when for me, the core idea makes no aesthetic prescriptions at all. Quite the opposite, except perhaps in the most meta of ways, I suppose. And so I find these uniformities, especially occurring in our attempts to honour something so diverse as the imagination, 
rather boring and even a bit depressing. It seems we produce an art of the imagination that then becomes a failure of the imagination somehow, showing in the end not the depths of ourselves, but the darths of our world. Perhaps I am simply jealous, or otherwise petty or resentful. I once tried to talk to some of the movement's originators, you see, show them my little pixies, but they seemed a cliquey bunch, and the assumption was apparently that if they didn't already know who you were, you wouldn't be worth knowing anyway. Certainly, I felt like they were people who expected me to have deeply snooked them, to know all about them and how interesting they evidently were, and then to hold them in a kind of awe. Perhaps I did not give enough away, perhaps I did not give away enough ghost strokes, or maybe I was even too aware of their status, such that I made them feel embarrassed by their own massive creds, or maybe it was because I was not able to put a knowing spin on the ins and outs of exactly what I myself was up to. I couldn't really say what it meant for the world. I just wanted to be myself. Oh, maybe that's it. I was too personal about it all and in not having the necessary detachment from my work and my work thus perhaps carrying too much of me, I ended up just kind of madly exploring my strangely inverted mind, not putting enough effort into setting myself up as some cultural arbitrator of the imaginal. Or maybe I was just a little bit shit. Still, I don't think that's any reason to be a twonk about it. Anyway, now Helio are going through some plurpics and telling us what this means and what all that represents. And suddenly I realise it is this I do not like. Even as, in my own attempts, I try to do something similar. Oh no, is this what I'm doing to them? Is it even somehow inevitable? I remember when I dreamed my first screech owl. How it stared out from a tree I couldn't tell it apart from. With big, black, alien eyes and hypnotised me, until I started to worry it was getting ready to prey on me. But then it flew out, out of my dream, silently, past me, and I woke up and felt like I had somehow finally understood what nature, or life, was really all about. It was somehow dark and terrifying, but it made me so happy. So I decided to become an autist, there and then, and digested the best alien screech owl tree I could muster, and indeed there was a kind of life in those eyes, and with a barely containable sense of excitement, I waved it ought to see. But three minutes later, it was posted back to me as a vert for sleeping pills. So that must be my problem with the Plurpix thing. Our images are no longer images. They are not mysteries, not even metaphors really, not even more, not any more. And it's all our fault. They can no longer speak for themselves, but only say what they've been designed to say, as symbols with definite meanings, dictionised clichés, Badges to be collected on one's transpersonal scout's uniform. Seen the soul octopus? Tick. Been a big cat? You bet. Tickled by hummingbirds? Bingo. Diamond sun? Over and done. Erpix are no longer the continuation of their own impossible discoveries, but simply signs. The culture has enshrined them now, denatured them as dead ends. We took our sacred delvings into the humanimalian imagination, this always fluid, infinite world, and we codified it, literalised it, reduced it to a few readily ingestible gestures, made it mundane, as in the day after Sundane, bought, sold, 
and nano-stated, all too human. Perhaps this upsets me most. The meat robot, please be silent, disco. No plants or animals anymore, only human symbols. We might still pix nature, but hardly ever do it from actual encounters, from experiences of living with the creatures, of being among them. Most likely, their memories come stripped straight from the sea, from some old drone dock, commanded to appear, and then traced. They are signs of our being apart, relics of a world colonised from inside the safest of houses, like the semi-translucent hides of souls displayed by imaginary hunters, too squeamish to respect what we have killed, too distant now to bend down and taste it. We can't even smell it anymore, the whole sea one big visual. I better go do the washing up before I say something stupid. Okay, I love you. Peace and lovage. Peace and lovage. Um, see you in the new year. All the best for that. Bye. All right there, honk. Hey, honk, honk. Hey, monkey, monkey. Say hello. Hello. Happy New Year, guys. We love you. Love from the creatures. Bye.